Hi everybody, we're up to lecture 11, Jesus in Jerusalem. It's Luke chapters 20 to 22. In the last lecture, we witnessed the climax of the travel account in Luke, which ended with Jesus entering the temple, cleansing it, and making it his own teaching area. We now turn towards his teaching ministry in the temple. And in chapters 20 and, and 21, that is what we actually have. It's in two parts. Chapter 20 to 21 verse 4 are his confrontations with the Jewish leadership. And then in chapter 21 verses 5 to 38, we have his teachings about the end times. So they're the first two sections the first two big sections of today's lecture. And the third section goes into chapter 22, which is the first part of the Passion Narrative. So the first big section is Jesus' confrontation with the Jewish leadership. We've got six episodes here, most of which are, are those confrontations. Luke follows Mark's gospel very closely now. We note the opening sentence. Now one day, while he was teaching the people in the temple and proclaiming the good news, it's a very significant phrase because we do know that he did spend a lot of time in, in the temple area teaching and preaching. In the first episode, Jesus Authority is questioned. Jesus has always taught authoritatively, as we know, with, with inner authority, a great sense of power, inner power. And he did that from the very first days of his ministry in Galilee. But now he's challenged again. He announces with a counter question, which forces the Jewish leaders into an impossible sort of situation. Jesus wins this first round and concludes with, nor will I tell you my authority for acting like this, which of course foreshadows his answer to the Sanhedrin in chapter 22. The second episode in this first section is the parable of the vineyard, a parable which almost certainly goes back to the Lord himself. And certainly in the Lord's day, there was a great social unrest and wealthy Lord lo landlords often chose to live elsewhere in the cities. However, there are clear signs of later Christian reworking, especially in the allusions to Scripture, the Old Testament. In some ways, the story as we now have it is an allegorical presentation of salvation history as St. Luke sees it. In the era of the prophets, these poor men of God faced rejection and sometimes even death. This happened to the Lord himself, and yet his death was transformed into victory, and a new era with a new people takes off. When Luke quotes Psalm 118, it's the stone rejected by the builders that became the cornerstone. That was a quotation which our early brothers and sisters in the faith really loved. He adds, anyone who falls on that stone will be dashed to pieces. Perhaps it may be an allusion to Isaiah chapter 8 verse 14 and a reminder to us of what Simeon said of the baby Jesus. He is destined for the fall and the rising of many in Israel. In the third episode, we have the paying of taxes to Caesar. Now, in the commentary, the, the huge commentary of Joseph Fitzmaier, he points out that there have been, over the course of history, three very different interpretations of what this parable is all about. What 
rendering to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and to God what belongs to God really means. The first interpretation stresses the fact that there are two kingdoms, the political and the spiritual, and each of those kingdoms has its own laws, and each is rather quite independent of the other. One proponent, the German historian Van Renke, says that this statement is by far the most important and influential statement that Jesus ever made. That's one interpretation. The second is to be taken a little bit ironically. Give to Caesar what is his, but isn't that insignificant when compared to God and God's kingdom? And the third is an interpretation that is against the zealots, those people who believe that the kingdom needs to be taken by force and they went around sometimes with daggers and were open to uh, stabbing any of the establishment figures of the Romans. The zealots, they refused to pay taxes to the Romans, whom they despised, and Jesus rejects their position and perhaps reminds people that the coin itself, with Caesar's face on it, belongs to Caesar, but the person, every person, belongs to God. The pronouncement presupposes a comparison of what is marked with Caesar's image and what is marked with God's image. The kingdom which Jesus preaches doesn't call into question Caesar's rightful kingship, but that is not the all-important aspect to human life. It's our relationship with God. The fourth episode is the resurrection of the dead discussion. The practice, this is an unusual, I rather enjoy it, passage. The practice of a man begetting children with his brother's widow was widespread in the ancient Near East. It was also part of the Mosaic law. The Sadducees, they were the conservatives, the priestly group, and uh, they really didn't believe in the resurrection from the dead. They believed that after we died, we had some sort of a shadowy existence. So they're the ones now trying to trap Jesus. And Jesus answers them by saying, it's impossible for earthly realities to really continue as they are in an afterlife and that to God all human beings are in fact alive. So the Lord is worlds apart from the world of the Sadducees. The fifth episode consists of two statements of Jesus, one about uh, the Christ and the other a condemnation of the scribes. The, that first saying is a bit difficult. We're not 100% sure of what it means. And certainly we're very unsure of what Jesus may have originally said. Luke will use Psalm 110 again in the Acts of the Apostles. And the second is incredibly strong, as, you, as you'd know. The sixth and final episode is the widow's might. We're meant to think of the generosity of this poor and defenceless widow. But also in the light of, of the condemnation of the scribes who swallowed the property of widows, which happens, we read about in the preceding section, perhaps Jesus is also deeply troubled by the whole system of religion which encourages widows to keep giving when they can't afford it. So that's the end of their first section. We move now into the second big section, the discourse on the end times. Luke 21, verses 5 to 38. Let's take a moment to, to review those two words, the two words, rather, eschatology and apocalypse. The word eschatology comes from the Greek word eschatology 
eschata, last things. What's going to happen when we die? What's going to happen when the world ends? That sort of thing is all eschatological talk. The word apocalypse, it's again another Greek word, it means revelation. Hence the last book of the Bible is called the Apocalypse or the book of Revelation. But when we think of Apocalypse and Revelation as, as a way of writing, as a way of thinking, it, it's really a way of imagining the future when we're going through a time that's very difficult for us especially, say, a time of persecution, then we're called to have hope that God will punish evildoers and reward the just. And how that's all imagined, of God, reward, God taking us through all this eventually and rewarding us for keeping faith, that's, the way that's all imagined is called apocalypse. The popular understanding of apocalyptic, a great catastrophe, with the battle in full swing between the forces of good and evil, that sort of captures it a little bit, quite a lot. The first section of the Apocalypse of Luke, a series of prophecies about Jerusalem. He speaks firstly about the fall of the temple, then of what will happen before this takes place. And finally, he describes the actual fall of the city. Jesus had proclaimed the imminent coming of God's kingdom. But as his death approaches, he understands that the kingdom will ultimately only arrive in complete form, sometimes into the future, as his disciples continue his mission. Now, Brendan Byrne, in his commentary on Luke, puts it like this. The eschatological discourse addresses the situation by showing that Jesus had accurately foreseen the trials that the community would have to suffer. He placed those trials in the context of a sequence of events leading up to the overthrow of evil and the final triumph of God, at the time of his own return as son of man. The discourse also had to dampen down false hopes and expectations arising out of events that might reasonably have been seen as signs that the final days were at hand. Such a catastrophic event, of course, was the fall of Jerusalem. So in the first section, focused on Jerusalem, we begin with the temple itself, the heart of the city. We move to the whole city and its destruction, and then to the coming of the Son of Man in the end times. Can I quote Brendan Byrne again? We retain the doctrine of the second coming in our affirmation of faith, not because we literally believe, as fundamentalists do, that Jesus will one day appear as Son of Man on the clouds of heaven, but because we believe that the biblical asser assertions to that effect affirm the eventual triumph of God's sovereignty in the universe, and that all is provisional till that occurs. I hope that gives us some sort of a sense of what's, what it ultimately means for us. If we are to compare Luke's apocalypse with Mark's, we note that the reference to Jerusalem's destruction is quite clear. Jerusalem will be surrounded by camps and trampled upon by pagans. Further, Luke clearly postpones the end times. The end times separates a little from Jerusalem. The fall of Jerusalem is the major crisis 
faced by the early church, and the symbol of that crisis will happen when the Son of Man returns again. And finally, Luke clearly invites us all to be vigilant. It's interesting, but if you ever go to the Holy Land and visit Masada, sort of the last stand of Jewish people against the Romans, from up top you can actually see where the Roman camps were, even though it's 2,000 years ago, and the sort of uh, ramp that they were building, remnants of it, are still there, clearly visible. So Jerusalem, as well as Masada, was surrounded by camps and eventually trampled on by pagans. The discourse takes place in the temple, not on the Mount of Olives, as Mark has it. After Jesus' prediction of the temple's destruction, he was asked, when will this happen? What sign will there be that it's all about to take place? And then Jesus goes off into some of these warning signs. False prophets, wars and revolutions, natural cataclysms. Apocalyptic descriptions in the line, really, of Ezekiel. And this is followed by descriptions of coming persecutions by both Jewish and pagan authorities and by even their own kith and kin. Jesus tells them, don't worry about preparing your defence. I myself shall give you an eloquence and a wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to resist or contradict. Finally, Jesus speaks of the desolation of Jerusalem, which shows obvious signs of that siege and fall. And the great Jewish writer Josephus tells us what happened. The second section of the eschatological discourse concerns the coming of the Son of Man, Luke turns from a past event, the destruction of Jerusalem, to a future event, the great eschatological event, the coming of the Son of Man, which Luke suggests will be the fulfilment of God's kingdom. There will be an extraordinary sign when this is to happen. There will be political, social and cosmic events. As Jesus was as Jerusalem was faced with a crisis when Jesus appeared to teach there, so will the world be faced with a crisis when he comes as Son of Man. And he adds that people should read the signs as they read nature and be ever vigilant. Now that's the end of the eschatological discourse in Luke, the second part of our presentation. Now we move into... The third part, chapter 22, verses 1 to 71. It's the first part of the Passion Narrative. I should say at the beginning, the Passion Narrative, which is the account of the Lord's martyrdom, has the highest degree of agreement in the Gospels and became quickly embedded in the memory of the early Christians. As it was such an unexpected and humiliating and dramatic way for Jesus to die, it cried out for understanding and interpretation. The early Christians turned to the scriptures to help them understand what had happened and why, and Luke in particular is at pains to show us that the death of Jesus does actually fulfill the scriptures. And the way he died was, in a real sense, necessary. In chapter 22, we can conveniently divide the events into four, four sections. First, the setting of the scene. Second, the Passover meal. Third, the drama on the Mount of Olives agony and arrest, and four, the hearing before the Sanhedrin. First now, then, the setting of the scene, 22 verses 1 to 30. We hear 
of the conspiracy being hatched between the chief priests and the scribes to eliminate Jesus, followed by the account of his betrayal by Judas. Luke omits the anointing of Jesus at Bethany, and like St. John, he speaks of Satan entering Judas. Then we have preparations for the Passover meal. Luke identifies Peter and John as the disciples who prepare Passover. And Jesus clearly takes the initiative. We should note that the term Last Supper isn't found in the New Testament. It's a later expression. Further, the synoptics say that the Last Supper was the Passover meal itself whereas St. John says it wasn't, but it occurred the day before Passover. So that in John, Jesus dies at the very time the priests in the temple are slaughtering the Paschal lambs to be eaten at Passover. Now we come to the Last Supper, the second section. Jesus says, I have longed to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Jesus then twice speaks of the kingdom of God before, the, before he um, institutes the Eucharist. Very deliberately setting, therefore, the Eucharist far more explicitly within the coming kingdom. He gives the cup to share until God's kingdom comes. The words of the institution are closer to St. Paul than they are to St. Matthew and Mark. Over the bread he says, This is my body which is given for you. As the bread is broken and shared, so is his body to be broken in death so that his spirit might be given to them. And over the cup, he says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which will be poured out for you. This special cup of blessing recalled for Jesus, for the Jews, their foundational experience, the Exodus and the Sinai covenant. It's the Lord's death that will found the new people of God liberated and filled with his spirit. And it's only after the institution of the Eucharist that the betrayer is mentioned. Luke, like St. John, has a discourse at the Last Supper. St. John's Last Supper discourse covers a number of chapters. Luke's is much briefer. Luke's has Jesus speak about how disciples are to exercise authority? Jesus saying, I'm in your midst as one who serves. He promises them rewards as the men who who have faithfully stood by me in my trials. And he speaks very directly to Simon Peter. I prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And once you have turned back, you in your turn must strengthen your brothers. And in the light of the coming crisis, he revises his instructions to them when they go, when they go out into the ministry. Now you are to be prepared, you are to be armed. The next section is Jesus on the Mount of Olives. We're still in chapter 22, now we're in verses 39 to 53. It's very clear that our Lord feared his forthcoming suffering and passion. Luke's account of the agony in the garden is shorter than Mark's. Many commentators omit verses 43 and the following, the angelic support and the drops of blood. The whole scene is framed by the warning, pray so that you may not enter into temptation, which is, of course, the last petition of the Lord's Prayer. The disciples fail to follow the Lord's advice. 
Luke's account of Jesus' arrest contains three elements. Jesus' reaction to the arrival of Judas in the crowd. Is it with a kiss, Judas, that you hand me over to that you hand over the Son of Man? Secondly, Jesus' reaction to the impulsive cutting off of the servant's ear, and he manifests his compassion by healing it. And thirdly, Jesus severely, serenely interprets the whole event. Did you come out, as it were, against a robber with swords and clubs? But now is your hour. And the fourth and the, uh, section of, of part three is Jesus before the Sanhedrin. There are some discrepancies about how many sessions the Jewish authorities had with Jesus and what happened at these sessions. Luke's account has the session in the morning, which is, is more likely. All accounts have Peter's denials and all speak of his being mocked and mistreated. Luke begins with Peter's denials. There is a significant detail about this in Luke. At Peter's third denial, the cock crows and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. The next episode is the mistreatment of Jesus. And in Luke, it seems to be the servants who mistreat him. Jesus remains silent all through this. And then thirdly, Jesus is brought before the Sanhedrin, where no witnesses are introduced, and there are no references to Jesus having spoken about the destruction of the temple. The questioning concerns Jesus being Messiah and Son of God, and his half answers is the basis for him being sent to Pilate. And there's no mention of, you are blaspheming Jesus. And just as the angel said of the infant Jesus, he will sit on the throne of his father David, and we be called Son of God, so it happens here. And Jesus remains fully controlled during this session. 